How to warn someone about the narcissist. You have become fully familiar with narcissists and narcissism. You have earned your stripes, gained your narc wings, call them what you will. You have read about and listened to material appertaining to narcissism. And if you've accessed my work, you've had access to the best. You have reduced your emotional thinking through the hard application of your willpower and utilizing the information to your betterment. Indeed, you may feel that you have almost graduated from the Tudor University with the wealth of information that you have been privy to. You remain vigilant, but you're not looking over your shoulder every five minutes for narcissists. With this reduced emotional thinking, you are able to spot narcissists more readily and evade them. And now you have seen a friend or a family member in the grip of a narcissist or someone that you believe is likely to be one. What can you do? Should you warn them? And if so, how do you go about it? I don't refer to the instance where you see your replacement as, for instance, intimate partner, primary source or intimate partner, secondary source, someone who is actually a stranger to you. But occasionally that might be somebody that you already know. Tempting as it might be where you're dealing with a stranger, in effect, the new victim. Tempting as it might be to warn that person, warn the stranger that has become your replacement, you're wasting your time. The charming of this new victim is so intense and the smearing of you as the disengaged from replacement means that your chances of persuading the new victim that we are what we really are amount to almost nil. In such a situation as that, you have your own defences to consider and invariably at that juncture your emotional thinking will be too high because of your recent disengagement or the recent continued engagement in some form with the narcissist meaning that you won't approach the task utilising logic. Moreover, the way that we have gone about the seduction of the new partner means that anything you say will be regarded as you being jealous, nasty and trying to break up this supposedly happy couple. Think back to when you were in the golden period, when you were being seduced. Would you have listened to anybody if they tried to warn you about who was actually seducing you? You would not have listened and even if you had, you would not have accepted it because of your heightened emotional thinking and lack of understanding about the narcissist. Accordingly, where you see somebody new being seduced and replacing you, tempting as it is to want to try and warn them as a combination of possibly protecting them and also a degree of satisfaction for it, of causing a problem to the narcissist, you have your own defences to consider and you must leave that new victim to determine their own fate. Harsh and heartless as that might sound, there is no point in trying to intervene. You'll fail and it will have consequences for you. But what of the situation where you had no or little prior involvement with this particular narcissist and you hadn't been ensnared by that particular narcissist? What then when you see a narcissist snaking his or her tendrils towards somebody that you care about, one of your friends, somebody who's a family, maybe a colleague? What do you do then? It may be the case that you are sufficiently aware, and thus in a rare group of those who are so aware and observant, that you identify the person that you care about in the midst of them being seduced. You recognize the red flags, most likely because you have experienced themselves, and now you see them again, but applicable with regard to the seduction of your friend or family member. This might be, for instance, you struggle to get to spend any time with this person anymore because we are monopolizing the time of the victim. The victim talks incessantly about us and how wonderful we are, making reference to how quickly we have fallen in love with them, how we want to whisk, away, whisk them away on a holiday within weeks of meeting, or even noises are being made about engagement and or living together with undue haste. Your friend exhibits that starry-eyed, breathless and almost hypnotic reaction to our charm offensive. Everything appears to revolve around us, 
they talk about what we do, what we want to do with them, and what we have been doing. You recognize these behaviors all too well, both in terms of how the insidious tentacles of our kind are snaking around this person, and also in terms of how they react. You know what lies ahead. You know the illusion will be woven thicker, deeply, and all more encompassing around this victim. You know that it will all turn sour as the inevitable devaluation comes along and the abuse is unleashed. As undoubtedly an empathic person, you have the overwhelming desire to want to help this person. You also feel obligated to share the knowledge, the narcocraft, that you have acquired. You may even feel evangelical about the need to prize open our grip and allow this person to be freed. If you do decide to help, what hurdles will you face? 1. The facade. Where you're dealing with a greater or mid-range narcissist, there is of course this facade of lieutenants and members of our coterie who will be only too happy to vouch for us. These people will confirm what a great person we are, kind, honourable, and how much we adore the person you are hoping to free. Not only will you be told this in order to unnerve and derail your attempt to secure this person's freedom, but the target will be repeatedly exposed to this propaganda. It is your word against the word of many. You therefore face an uphill battle in that regard. 2. The addictive nature of the love bombing. Everybody likes to be treated well. If a person is swept off their feet, treated like a queen, placed on a pedestal, complimented, fated, wooed, provided with treats and gifts, exposed to repeated delights and such like, what is there not to like? Who would ever want to give that up? This power of our charm, magnetism and love bombing make it very difficult for the victim to say no and give up what is being offered to them. 3. The mirroring. I have often explained that because of our mirroring that you fall in love with yourself. This is so compelling that should you try to intervene to halt this, then you are denying somebody themselves. That is difficult to achieve. Uh, number 4. Our ubiquity. In order to try to persuade the person that you care about that we are something other than we appear to be, you actually need to get some time with them to do this. We are monopolizing the victim's time. Either through our presence, through our telephone calls, the creation of ever-presence, our texting, and the use of proxy behaviors through our lieutenants and our coterie. You are outnumbered, and it makes your task all the more arduous. 5. The smear. You as this interfering intervener will be smeared. When we arrive in the life of one of our victims, we also like to charm everybody around this person as far as possible. This is to bolster the facade, and it is also to ensure that there are no hindrances to the seduction. We are adept at instinctively or knowingly identifying those who are suspicious of our motives, those who are wary of our behavior, and who may well brief against us, since we can detect this promptly. We will take steps to isolate you from our victim. Not only that, we will smear you in a variety of ways. For instance, you are jealous of what we and the victim have, and we will invent conversations where that has been said. We will suggest that you made a pass at us, even though we, you knew that we were with your friend, sister, cousin, etc. Once again, this is fabricated, but we do this with such conviction, based on our knowledge and experience, that the victim always nearly takes our side over that of somebody else. We may also suggest that you are the one trying to control the victim, a classic piece of projection and blame sifting where we suggest that you, as the intervening factor, are always seeking to control this person's life. We drip feed that idea into the victim's mind. Of course, you are only trying to do the right thing, but we shall paint this in a completely different light. Number six. We often select those victims who have suffered in some way previously as a consequence, with them already being tenderized, this means that the victim is ever so grateful to now have somebody as doting and kind as us, or rather apparently doting and kind as us. The very weakness which led to them suffering previously is exploited once again, causing them to cling tighter to us and to move away from you. 7. Gullible 
Most people are gullible. They wish to think well of people. They take people at face value and trust them accordingly. And this creates a vulnerability that is exploited by us. Number eight, preempting. We identify that you are a troublemaker, someone who may try to thwart our ambitions with the victim. Accordingly, we tell the victim that we anticipate you will say things about us. We may even admit to some of the things that we know that you're likely to say about us in order to demonstrate that we've nothing to hide and provide an excuse for those things. This then endears us to our victim and allows them to tell you, as their prospective freedom fighter, that we've actually already admitted to the allegations and explained why it happened and you accept that. Thus, the sting, heat and effect is removed from your potential disclosure. Faced with these hurdles, a determined and experienced opponent and as and a seemingly supine victim, it is entirely understandable if you decide that there is no prospect of success and you shall just have to let the matter run its course in the same way that you would when you see your replacement being ensnared. You do, however, have an advantage. This time, because it's a friend or a family member, you know the victim well. They know you well. They trust you. You are not strangers. Understand that invariably you will only have one attempt to make them see the light. Repeated attempts to persuade them only causes you to play into our hands as the interfering, crazy-making, controlling and jealous best friend or the controlling parent. Whereas your replacement will regard you with suspicion, the person that you care about, the friend or family member, will at least listen to you. Much in the same way as dealing with a smear campaign, you need to allow the victim to make their own decision. To that end, you need to 1. Explain the behaviours that you have witnessed and why they are problematic. 2. Explain why you know them to be problematic, based on your own experience, material that you have read. 3. Explain that you are stating this purely because you care and you respect that it is this person's life, so you're only going to mention it to the once and let them make the decision. Four, show to them independent material in a succinct form. Don't overlo overload them, which shows the various behaviours are abusive, narcissistic in nature and part of the seduction. Five, invite the person to flush our behaviour out by asking certain questions. See the early warning detector in that regard. This approach may then buy them time to question what is happening. This will give them the time to reflect themselves and work it out. If they don't see it now, repeating it will make no difference. The brainwashing and seduction has been effective already, and all you'll do is end up alienating yourself with this friend. However, by planting a seed of consideration, reflection and doubt, you may well cause this delay to the seduction to bring out a glimpse of our true selves as we fight to assert control, especially if the narcissist is lesser or mid-range. The challenge to their assumed flawless seduction, the hindrance to the otherwise predicted ensnarement, and their lack of control compared to a greater or ultra may well result in them lashing out at an early juncture, with the ignition of fury providing evidence. This will likely to be a clincher in allowing you to adopt a rare smug smile and declare, see, what did I tell you? You do have the chance to be a freedom fighter for your friend or colleague or family member. The window of opportunity is slim and the odds are stacked against you, but you can succeed. If you fail at the first attempt, don't labour the point. A second bite of the cherry will not prove fruitful and you will actually cripple your ability to assist the person you care about during de the later devaluation. Instead, you need to be ready to catch this person when the golden period ends and the devaluation commences. You've done enough to ensure that when the battlefield alters, when the devaluation starts, that you then have more than a fighting chance to secure this person's freedom. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for listening.